Hi, and welcome to CISO Talk. My name is Mitch Ashley. I am principal with TechStrong Research and CTO with TechStrong Group. CISO Talk is a twice monthly and also an online roundtable, an interactive roundtable that we do with cybersecurity professionals, executives, senior, senior level folks, thought leaders, practitioners, people who are living and breathing cybersecurity. And our goal in this, uh, in this uh, series we're doing right now, it's a masterclass series, uh, called CISO Talk Masterclass, uh, lightning, uh, catching lightning in a bottle. Uh, we talk about various topics, some of it uh, driven from Matt and some of his work and, and uh, presentations that he's done on this particular series. So we're excited about doing a series within CISO Talk. So we, uh, this is a very interactive and uh, engaging kind of discussion. We all kind of free will it and, and enjoy and react to what each other says. And we'll see where it goes. You never know quite where it's going to end up, which is the fun part, too. So um, we're going to do a series of introductions. And I'll ask each of, each of our um, participants to introduce themselves. Then I'm going to ask Matt to do a little bit more on our topic about stop playing whack-a-mole, adopt a common framework. What a cool idea. Great. Let's start with um, Mike Rothman, if you want to introduce yourself. Well, uh, hello, Mitch. Hello, Matt. Hello, Beth Ann. You know, nice to see everybody. I'm Mike Rothman, uh, president of Securosis, founder of Disrupt Ops, which is now a Firemon company, and a variety of other things that I can't remember because I'm just a bit older now and my memory is just not as uh, good uh, as it used to be. Uh, but I've been doing security in some way, shape, or form for over 30 years at this point before it was a thing. Um, frequent guest on a, a lot of the different tech strong shows. Uh, and, um, you know, I guess the one thing I'll say is uh, it doesn't matter what we're talking about. I probably have an opinion. <laughs> I, I can back that up. I think that's pretty, yes, we pretty know. true. <laughs> Great. Beth Ann, would you introduce yourself? No, yeah, thanks so much. And again, thank you all for uh, today's conversation. Similar to Mike, um, I've covered a lot of the 12 domains that we consider underneath information security. Uh, my name is Beth Ann Bigham, uh, Chief Security and Compliance Officer at Axiom. And uh, security's route to becoming a, a CISO, I think... Um, the main thing I'd like to bring to the table is a different lens, right? Um, because we are in an aggressive period and having multiple lenses is really what's required these days. So looking forward to this conversation for sure, because framework and hygiene don't always mean the same thing. Important point. Yeah. It's, uh, and if we're talking to the same people all the time, we're not learning much, are we? So yeah. <laughs> expanding our net, our, our, our topic, our circle of colleagues is always a good thing to do. Thanks for joining us. Matt, mm -hmm. introduce yourself. Matt's the co-host of this program. I know I've been doing the talking about it. It's kind of saving up to let Matt, Matt both introduce himself. And then he's going to kick off the topic around frameworks. Go for it, Matt. Mitch, thank you so much. Again, Matt Newfield. I am the co-host of uh, CISO Talks. We've been doing this for quite a while, and I'm actually really excited about today's episode and the series in general. Um, you know, when, when we're going in and helping organizations, when I'm coming in new to an organization, I find it very interesting how few times I will join a company and get a good answer to what framework are we following? What is the foundation that we built our cyber program? What is the foundation we built our IT program on? Many organizations and probably a lot of our viewers organizations cannot answer that question. And they may have had a cyber program for a decade. A few of them may have had Mike Rothman style cyber programs that are in the 30 years and they go back and I'm pretty sure that program's on a punch card somewhere. Um, but you know, they don't have a framework. And I was giving a speech um, in another part of the United States about six months ago, and I asked this question to a pretty sizable organization, and we'll leave it at that. And the answer I got was very strange. And I talked to this one group, and they're like, we use this framework, and I'm going to make this up. We use CIS. Oh, okay. Then I asked this other group, same company, what framework? They're like, oh, we're a niche shop. And then I'd ask another group and they're like, ah, we're essentially. And I'm like, how is this possible across the board? And then I talked to the CIO and CISO and they weren't aware that they were using any of them. So when we're having this conversation, really the meat of today's program is going to be with Mike and Beth Ann helping people understand not only the importance, 
But the how, how do you make these determinations? What's the pros and cons? And we're not going to go into detail of each and every one of the frameworks. That would be not only boring and dry, but wouldn't really help a lot of companies. But just the importance of having a common language and the analogy that I use all the time, and I imagine is apropos for most, if we all get into a room together and we all speak different languages, right? Someone only speaks French, someone only speaks German, someone doesn't speak at all, someone speaks with sign language, but we don't understand what we're doing because there's no commonality, you'll get nothing done and you end up with chaos. And in our world, chaos equals language. All right, so I've laid this thing out. This is where we're going to spend our time today. And, you know, prior to the start of the show, Beth Ann was speaking and we were having a, we always do these little preambles. And you said something that I find fascinating. And I thought we could use to kick this conversation off. Uh, and it was framework versus hygiene. And that framework does not equal hygiene. And I'd love to expand. I know Mike's got an opinion on this, as you stated, but I'd love to start, Beth Ann, with you. Just get your thoughts on, you know, why would you make such a bold statement? Yeah. Well, thanks again, Matt and team, for today's conversation. You know, frameworks are designed specifically, to your point, um, Matt, to help define common language between controls. Uh, and those controls are, in essence, um, what we have anchored in, you know, a quality management system or policies or standards or procedures. But what I found over the years is that there's very few um, areas of focus where from a governance risk and compliance perspective, we're interpreting that into common behaviors, right? I mean, there is a direct connection between hygiene practices and framework and then the ability to demonstrate you know, passing the framework or being compliant to a framework. But when, to your point around, you talk to a CISO, you talk to people that are boots on the ground and you try to have a conversation around, hey, did you realize that you are helping to demonstrate compliance or did you realize that your role in this is blah, blah, blah? There's really no understanding about how the two worlds connect. Uh, and as a, a CISO of an organization that is... Um, you know, sort of like, you know, a connector of companies. One of the things that we have found is we've got to break that conversation down. Like, and I constantly talk to my team, don't use the word controls. People don't even know what the word control means, right? <laughs> What's your practice? Are you practicing what you do every day, what you, how you perform? Um, you know, is it demonstrating that kind of uh, adherence? But at the end of the day, we're all defending at the code level, right? And I think that's the issue we have right now is a lot of the frameworks are designed around the policies, the governance, the oversight, and it doesn't necessarily double click on is the hygiene that's connected to that actually working. So CISOs that get it, they're looking at metrics and controls that demonstrate hygiene. Uh, so I'm gonna stop there for a minute because I can keep yeah. going. <laughs> no, as as could I, Beth. And that, you know that that's an interesting point, and and it, it's very relevant to a lot of the work that that I'm doing right now in terms of helping organizations kind of get their arms around specifically cloud security yes. and cloud security governance and frameworks, and what does all this stuff mean? Um, and you, you know, we've done a lot of work with the Cloud Security Alliance, and and they just recently updated their cloud control matrix, and you know, and it's a whole list of stuff, and it looks dangerously like NIST, but I'm not going to get into that right now. I really want to get to the point of, you know, there are two aspects that, that we, um, you know, kind of forget about, right? And, and, and some folks, when they get into a new position, they just think, oh, pick a framework, right? Because then that gives us, as Matt says, you know, you know, the common vernacular that we need. But, and, and that example, Matt, you used with the three groups within the same organization using different frameworks, um, they kind of, and, and you said you talk to the CIO and CISO and they don't know that anybody's used it. It's like, what do you do every day, man? What, 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 are you, what are you doing when you come into the office every day if you don't know that you have teams that are using different frameworks and different aspects of the business? But that notwithstanding, right, it's, it, it, again, what we don't do good enough, well enough, I guess is the right grammar, is focus on the outcomes up front. 
right? What outcomes do we are we trying to achieve? And then you pick your framework, right? Your vernacular, your set of controls, you, you know, and ultimately the how. And I, I think, Beth Ann, that's what you're getting at, right? The controls tell you what needs to be done. They don't tell you the how. And, and that's where we have a major gap right now in terms of taking this practice, taking the program, focusing on business outcomes, which is a huge part of the CISO's job every day, right? Interface with business leaders, help them understand why they need to do a lot of this security stuff. And then we kind of are also in that position of having to manage down to a set of, as you pointed out, Beth Ann, right? Increasingly application-centric developers, right? As we move towards DevOps, what the hell does that mean? Oh, God, you know, right. So now I just put DAST in. The, so if I put something in my pipeline, then I'm good, right? Does that make it with the framework? And so there are just multiple disconnects all through the process, starting from what the hell are we trying to achieve, right? All the way down to, great, does that mean I need to use, you know, kind of AWS code commit as the way to, you know, kind of manage my deployment pipeline, right? And, and somebody has got to be able to, you know, make sense of this. And that's what, you know, kind of creates the challenge of most CISO oriented jobs, right? Is that they, you know, wait, I'm talking to the business folks one day to tell them why security is important. And I'm talking to the developers the next day about, you know, kind of why, you know, the, the, the source code analysis tool that they're using isn't getting the job done. Mike, I think you're spot on with that. Um, and, and you know, it, it starts shift left, right? We, we ran an exercise last year taking a methodology that you use in common development, you know, shift left with your code, you know, analysis, and we applied it to the GRC space. And the concept here is that if I could push discussion of controls or adherence to practice higher upstream, starting at the contract level, starting at, um, you know, project initiation, where you typically see it, right? You get your security engineers in there and they're helping to assess the risk. But my own team is talking different languages, right? My GRC folks are assessing at risk against policy, not risk against code. My engineers are. So last year, we started a shift. No, no more. We are defending at the code level. The GRC team is starting to train and learn aspects of engineering, right? So if a, if a project's coming in, it's a, it's a software advanced design project, how are they looking to ensure automation of the controls before it hands off to the engineers that are looking at the architecture of the controls? You know, the, the threat actors have had a, a, an ability to be single focus, right? They understand architecture. I, I, I forgot who I heard this from, so I can't claim it, but they understand our architecture and our engineer designs better than we do because they can focus on it. And we're just... You know, we, you know, organizations don't have that same luxury or haven't put architecture back in the space. Architecture has to take lead. And I'm constantly having this conversation with my architect um, is that um, we if, if we really focus on good architecture practices, that helps simplify how much defense I got to do, you know, I'm, I'm managing on the back end kind of thing. So it's, it's a, the, the world is coming closer and we can't really operate in our silo services anymore. We are all connected. Yeah, you bring up some interesting points. And I think for a lot of people, they would hear all this and it's like, OK, so how do I begin? And, you know, I've heard two key things here. Well, I've heard a lot of key things, but of, of starting points, you know, we talk about with the end in mind and outcome base, and I, I could not agree more. You know, we've had episodes talking about why CISOs lose their job, and it's because they cannot communicate with the business owner. Um, again, commonality is not there. So being able to get those requirements from the business uh, is key. But building out that 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 framework Right. Yeah. Whatever that is, um, you know, I, I will just for Mike's sake say, you know, everybody's going NIST because Mike is the biggest fan. That is for everything that the thing for him. But building out that commonality is a way for us to start moving forward. So if you're talking to a CISO or you're talking to a head of security that goes, OK, I understand. I talk to the business all the time. How do I decide what? framework to use? What do I set as my base, knowing that 
automation has got to be key. I couldn't, I mean, we could spend an entire episode talking about manual controls versus automated controls, especially at the code level. If they're not automated, you're kind of done. Um, because <laughs> the amount of money to audit, I, your your milestone gates would just be impossible. Yeah, like, yeah. How do executives start Hey, hey, Matt, before we get there, can, can I just get a point of clarification for you? And I'd, I'd love to get Beth Ann's perspective on this, too. Mitch, forget you, man. Who cares? Um, <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, but, you, you, you know, we, we've been kind of using terms somewhat interchangeably, you know, program and framework. And I don't think that's what we intend to do. So why don't you, you know, can we just spend like a minute and just, you know, kind of just say, all right, when we talk about program, this is what we mean program. When we talk about framework, this is what we mean framework. And because when we're talking about selecting a framework, how does that fit into the program? Is it, does it fit in the program? Is it the program? Right. So, I mean, I just think that that's a, a point of confusion that a lot of folks just don't get. That's a great point, Mike. I would agree with you. As a security lead or um, a compliance lead or a chief security officer, your program will consist of multiple frameworks. It has to. Uh, and so the sweet sauce is being able to connect the multiple frameworks into an integrated dashboard, to Matt's point, that demonstrates my true risk posture to leadership. And then you can start turning the knobs to right size how much remediation we're actually talking about. Um, so I want, so yes, I agree with you. I, I can, I could talk hours going down this path as well. Um, but I think the, this, the first question I think Matt, that you were asking is the starting place is we have to understand our stacks, right? Again, architecture, but, what is in your stack? Are you hybrid? Are you try, are you on-prem going to the cloud or are you a full cloud stack? Uh, you, you know, are you on-prem dedicated? You know, so what's your build? What's your stack? What's your environment? Who are you serving? Your clients will dictate uh, what kind of frameworks they expect to see. If it's heavy global, you may have to do a blend between this and ISO. Uh, if you're in the automotive industry, TISAX is coming in hot and heavy, even though that's ISO. They, they, TISAX focuses a lot more on development hygiene, right? So, so understanding who you service, what's your stack, your current environment, what, are you, what is what is your business trying to accomplish? So if you have growth, you know, it's amazing. As a CISO, I think we maybe uh, were one of the few roles in a leadership organization where you have to talk multiple languages as well, internal, right? So speaking to my sales leadership team, what are they trying to grow? Strategic or chief security um, strategy officer, what are they trying to grow? That may acquire, mean I have to acquire more, framework certifications to help them achieve their growth targets. So anyhow, understanding the business really is the start of what your framework methodology will be. And then Mike, you've spent a lot of time talking about the cloud, just the, the technical frameworks that then support the data protection piece of your NIST and your ISO. They're all interconnected for sure. You know, Beth, and I think, you bet. I think really, oh, go ahead, Mitch. you have yeah, said, no, I was just going to say, you connected some really important things. I think you you can kind of look in the rearview mirror and go to your go to your contracts folks, and they'll tell you what what compliance you have to meet, what frameworks might go with that, or you can at least determine that. That's pretty easy, relatively speaking. Uh, it, it's the looking forward part of where you're going, and I, I really like how you're, you're you're saying it starts with the code because we've all been in security for a while and. I think we've shed this paradigm of it being network centric, right? It's pizza boxes, it goes in racks, it goes in data centers and that whole stuff, right? When we all started our careers in, in security at different points. And it's all about the stack. It's all about software at whatever level and anywhere it's at from an IoT device to what our cloud looks like. And yeah. your point about it's got to be attached to where the business is headed because being compliant with something we needed five years ago isn't necessarily going to get you what you need to do in the next year or two yeah. or five, right? So we've got to raise our heads out of this kind of security community that we talk to every day and talk to the business to help, maybe even help shape where that's going. 
So I, I think it's important to also think about, you know, kind of the actual compliance and regulatory overhead that we have mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. the structure of the program and the potential frameworks that you would plug into the program in order to support the business initiatives, right? So that example, Beth Ann, that you used about, mm -hmm. I had to sit with my sales leadership to you know, help understand how they're going to achieve their growth targets because that will have systems impact. That systems impact will have security posture ramifications to that, exactly. which is a different thing than saying we're taking some credit cards, which means we've got some PCI that we got to deal with. What are we going to do on, on that front? Because that does tend to be rather static. That does tend to be something that you can hopefully put in a box with a bunch of different payment processors now that you just don't have to deal with a lot of that stuff and with SaaS services. And it's just, you know, I remember sitting and this was probably 15 years ago. I sat with, with a, a, a leader at a, a cellular company who said, my objective is to get my PCI scope to zero. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, this was 15 years ago. So I said, <laughs> good luck with that, man. Um, you know, and then it turns out, you know, 15 years later, we're like, wow, if you actually architect your stuff correctly, you can kind of get there. Right. But, you, you know, more of the point is we've got the, the stuff that the <laughs> auditors are going to come in and look at. You, you, you know, because they're substantiating the different controls and there has to be a lot more formality around that framework. Right. <laughs> and then there's the stuff we got to do to run our business. And, and that's where the program and, and kind of those specific control objectives and those frameworks and those technical things that we have to do to achieve those that plays in. Right. And I always kind of called it, you know, when I was trying to explain it to business people that found themselves in a security role, I, I kind of talked about two two sets of books. Right. And accounting people are like, oh, my God. It's a different <laughs> show. Mike. That's, yeah. Yeah. Right. It, it, it's it's the idea that you've got a, a set of language and and, you know, kind of reporting and dashboarding and that kind of stuff that communicates to, you know, kind of your um, customers, in effect. Right. You know, kind of the leaders there. And then you have the operational things that you have to do to run your business. Right. And that's who's patching what. You know, where's my hygiene on that front? You know, you know, what am I doing to you know upgrade this? And they're two different things. Right. Because if you if you make the mistake of walking into a board meeting with your operational metrics, you will figure out very quickly that you either will not be invited to the next one and probably need to start dusting off your resume um, or some, you know, somebody will, you know, take, uh, uh, you know, or have mercy or, or show kindness and say, that's not the discussion we're having right now. And again, that gets back to the bifurcation that a lot of CISOs have to have, which is on, you know, one meeting. And, and it's funny, it was, we were getting on the call today. But then you were trying to wrap up another call. You're taking a call in there. And, and it's just like, and I can only imagine one of them is, you know, a senior manager type thing. And you're talking business stuff. And the other is an operational problem. And you're talking to somebody in the sock. And, and you have to be incredibly nimble in this role to be able to and, and, and be able to context switch almost, you know, kind of seamlessly in order to be able to survive, you know, kind of in the CISO role moving forward. Yeah, I think that integrated framework methodology, I remember years ago, we started, oh, I just almost had a flashback. Um, we started with trying to merge ISO and NIST and it was, you know, and, and then don't try to lay like FISMA, high trust CMNC, like all that other stuff on top of that, right? <laughs> so, Something at um, Windmills, I think that was, that's, that's a <laughs> tough problem. <laughs> I know, so, you know, but I think you're right, um, Mike, it's, it's, it's amazing to be on a journey where you have to constantly adjust the interpretation of these, these controls and the framework. And what am I asking my product team to do versus maybe my, uh, you know, cloud services team to do? And, and is there an overlap between those two organizations? Um, and I, I think we're about to hit a, a tsunami, actually, because, you know, the, there's still issues, right, at the code level. Um, to your point, um, Mitch, about um, infrastructure. I, I mean, we still have hygiene issues down at the firm level, you know, firmware level, right? Oh, yeah. Um, so, so the question becomes: You've got um, our risk, you know, program like the insurance carriers are coming in, and they're, they're starting to see huge numbers that maybe weren't anticipated in across industries a long time ago. So that 
risk appetite is, is, is you know, those things are going to be evolving. Um, you've got, you know, the need to really build out security and evolve, evolve security teams so that they're speaking risk appetite. And they understand the controls from all the different framework lenses. Uh, I think we have a little bit of, a, of, of investment to do in and reboot maybe in that security space uh, to, to be ready for, for the next chapter, for sure. Uh, and it starts with making sure if you're selecting a framework, what's its role? What's its purpose? How can you leverage it? How can you maximize it? And then how do you connect them all together? Because it sure, it sure as heck is not like this huge inventory of evidence. But like, what is that? What is that really showing? Right. It shows that you've got evidence, but it doesn't really help management understand, well, what's my risk posture? Well, and it can show you evidence in this one little area. I always say, you know, if you're really good on the other side of an audit, you can make things look a certain way. Someone's asking for evidence. You go, oh, here, here's some evidence. They go check. And they're like, don't don't look behind this curtain over yeah. here. So, you know. As we, we always try to relay this back to our audience and, and what you can hear from experts that we're talking to between Beth Ann and Mike is it's complex. There is not a single answer of, oh, if you happen to pick framework A, if you happen to go with ISO, you know, depending on your business, um, you're in great shape and the world is going to be your oyster. It's very complex and there are a lot of questions that you really need to answer. And I, I, I wrote some of them down that I, I really like that you all are talking about. The where are you in the world? The who are you serving both internally and externally? All the business goals and sales goals can really drive that conversation. So one piece of advice I would give out to you know new CISOs, people who are trying to become CISOs, they're is to change your mindset. A lot of people look at this role that some of us here have as it's cyber is the protection of assets via technical controls, and they forget this entire other side of our world. So you should make sure you're spending time to understand the importance of the programs versus the frameworks around the world. And you know, to add that complexity, Mike, to your earlier statement, what countries do you deliver it? Because sometimes that will also force your hand on frameworks. And if you don't know, ask for help. We've said it a million times on the show. We're all part of the same team. I, you know, I don't work with Axiom every day. Beth Ann and I are not part of the same company. Our paychecks come from different people, but we're allies. Mike and I have been allies for decades. Ask for help. Find someone to give you advice, you know, pay for that advice or, or, you know, join some CISO roundtables that are talking about this. Because if you build out that common language, it's not that if you're wrong, you're in trouble. It is you want to be right as often as possible at the beginning because you will waste time. Yeah, I, I want to jump on. I want to jump on that one for a second, because, you, you know, one of the things that I think we forget is it's okay to be wrong, right? In fact, you will be wrong because we're dealing with a foundation that's constantly changing, right? And, and, and if you kind of go at it and, and it's the whole analysis paralysis thing, right? If you, if you sit there and wait until you have the perfect framework or perfect program or everybody bought in, right? I mean, you never get anything done. You never get forward motion moving. So I've always been one to say, just get going. Right. Understand you're going to be wrong. Understand you have to build that adaptation into your process. Right. Get because going and be you know, the applications are earlier, going to change. Right? The platforms, but then your point, your stacks are going to mm -hmm. change. You're going to be migrating to some different cloud platform because some, you know, business unit has some legitimate reason to do that. And that starts to put some pressure on, you know, kind of the decisions you made from a control standpoint, from a reporting standpoint, possibly from a, you know, substantiating against the framework standpoint. So um, we're not looking for perfection here, right? We're looking for motion. And, and the whole concept that we're trying to introduce here is that a framework gives you a common vernacular in order to get things moving. But ultimately, you've got to take that framework and said control objectives that go along with that framework and tailor those to your business to achieve the business outcomes that we've been 
task to do, right? That uh, that is the yeah. mission of the security organization. And and we kind of forget a lot of those things because we get into work and we put our fire extinguisher on and we figure out what's burning the hottest on our backside, <laughs> right? And 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 we deal with that every day. Um, and sometimes, especially in the leadership role, you have to take a step back and figure out what's working, what's not working. Is the framework still appropriate? What what assumptions did I make when I made a lot of those decisions? Have those changed? And if you're not constantly being critical about those kind of things, again, really hard to be successful in this role. Well, if there's <laughs> truth, there will always be another framework, right? Or another ring. <laughs> so don't worry about picking the right one. You'll, you'll have plenty of opportunity to choose multiple. Um, I, I bet this is is kind of our last topic to to bring it all together. Um, Matt, you always talk about the the community that that we engage with to help each other. We're in, we're allies in this. Um, maybe Beth Ann, if you would share, how would you describe the people, your community, the people that you talk with about security, and are they all in healthcare, like your company? Are there people from your from your past roles? How do you build out that network if you're someone that's entering at a new level, a more strategic level in, in a CISO role? I think that's a great question, Mitch. Um, you know, my 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 um, having multiple lenses guide you through right sizing this conversation is so important. Um, so, you know, my, my, most of my, my experience was in the healthcare sector. And then when I moved over, cause I'm in tech and data now, and it, uh, told, like, I felt like I was having a little bit of whiplash because the expectations about regulation and how do I support multiple companies that are across multiple industries with different regulatory expectations, um, so I tend to reach out to leaders in all the industries that we um, support and we collaborate because their lenses are so different. Someone in the automotive industry, and it's funny because they're all regulated, but their needs are very different. And so understanding how they look at issues gives me more insight to how I can look at my own issues uh, and so that just that ability to converse across multiple lenses, I think, is so important. Yeah, I think, too, we've um, you know, a lot of us are anxious to get back to in-person events. And frankly, yeah, the event itself and the speakers and all that are interesting. It's the networking that happens. Yes. That's where you run yes. into you know, people from other industry, cross-pollinization of ideas and engagement and things you hadn't heard of before. Different exactly. I know, Mike, you like to talk at events, and that's an opportunity for you to connect with people. I just like to talk if you haven't figured <laughs> that one out yet. Um, that too. But, uh, you know, and, and, and to, you know, kind of pile on to, to Beth Ann's point there, I, I think you have to take both a local and a global perspective of things. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, you know, wherever you are, there are people who are doing security where you are, right? So go grab beers, be social if you drink, whatever you do, right? You know, kind of go grab lunch, you know, a breakfast, a coffee, whatever it is, but get plugged into your local community. Because even if they're not in the same business, if it's roughly the same little size organization, there are going to be some commonalities are going to be some things that, you know, you like. And, and if you don't know anybody, your show, whatever, ask some of your key vendors, right? Their reps know people, you know, kind of locally that can introduce you to other folks, you know, from a network working standpoint. But I also want to, you know, talk about the fact that when I started in this business, it was going to a lot of shows. It was, you know, kind of, and it was just being there for a long period of time. And I just got to know a lot of people. Um, and, and that, you, you know, that was more about persistence and longevity than it was anything else. And then what, what's funny is that, you know, when Twitter kind of started coming on to, to the scene and what was this 10, 12 years ago, what have you, you know, I started meeting other people, you know, via Twitter and I wasn't, you know, kind of one of the early folks there, but it's funny. I mean, I see folks who are literally graduating from college and starting to interact with everybody. Right. And now I see where they are now. If they're not CISOs, they're one step away. Right. And it was just like, I remember when you were in like security diapers and and <laughs> they, they were on, you know, basically an accelerated 
path because they extended themselves. They made contacts with, you know, folks that have been both influencers as well as just in the trenches for a long time. And they really put a lot of their both education and their ability to leverage that network on steroids, so to speak. Right. And, And you just see in terms of their career progressions where they're fairly young folks and they've got pretty big jobs at this point. But that's because even before they were out of school working in, you know, kind of real corporate type of roles, they were already plugging into that global fabric of security folks that want to help, right? When people reach out to me, whether it's via Twitter, it's like, I want to find a way to help you, right? I want to try to pay it forward. I, I suspect Beth Ann's in the same boat. I know Matt is, right? In, in that we want to help. So don't be bashful if you're getting, you know, kind of uh, involved in this thing. I'm not going to sit there with my tin cup and go, oh, that's 200 bucks or, you know, whatever is like that. It's, it's like I pay it forward because that's what happened with me. When I started in this business, I had people who helped me and I want to be able to do that for other folks now, really that next generation. Yeah, to no, close- I- Go ahead. Well, well, I was just going to do one little thing of merging uh, the comment, Mitch, that you made and Mike is for the for the individuals that are just starting. Once you pick the framework, at least you communicate that to your leadership and to the board and measure yourself against that. Give yourself at least a year. And one of the things that uh, I was taught, which I think was so effective, is you have to hit a baseline. So when you start your your responsibility, that issue a 100-day report, right? Here is the state of controls after my first 100 days. This is what's working, what's not working, and here's what you're going to see me change against this framework. And uh, that is so important. Uh, So I just want to add that to the checklist as well. I, th- I think that's great. And, and really, to sum that up in one word, it's transparency, yes. right? We have this fear in our organization, not Unisys, but in our you know, group, Cisco, yeah. so it's a collective of not being transparent because that could cause us problems. Transparency is not the cause of problems, right? Yeah. Inaction is the cause of problems. And, and we have to do that. You know, Mike, to, to pile on what you were saying to close this out, there are no dumb questions, Right. We ask questions. Stop. That's it. And, you know, some of them come with more experience or less experience, but they're not dumb questions. And you have to be willing to put yourself out there. I would guarantee that if you're looking at the four of us, we still ask dumb questions today. Right. It happens all the time, um, depending on your perspective. But you got to put yourself out there. You've got to have the conversation and you've got to be willing to fail. And really to tie this back, Mitch, to the beginning, because I know we're out of time and Mitch is the great wrap up here. When we say stop playing whack-a-mole, adopt a common framework, I think what you're hearing from our panel is pick one. You have to do your base work. You know, don't pick one that has nothing to do with your business, has nothing to do with your objectives and has nothing to do with what you do for a living. But you have to pick one. You have to start somewhere so that you can build all of what you heard about out within your organization and you can measure yourself to it. So stop waiting. Pick one. You have questions. Build your network and ask. You can go on Twitter. You can go on LinkedIn. Join some of these panels. Um, Most of them are Chatham House rules. And don't be afraid to say, I don't have a framework. I need help. You'd be surprised, as Mike said, how many people will jump out to go, let me help you because we all got help when we were doing the same thing. Great wrap up. Thank you, Matt. What on behalf of Matt and myself as co-host. Thank you, Beth Ann. Bye again. Great to have you on, and we look forward to having you back. Mike Rothman, as always, great, great interacting with you. You always have the best one-liners, so I can never keep up with you. And Matt. <laughs> And of course, Matt, thanks for your inspiration on this topic and the others that are part of this master series. So encourage people to connect in the ways we talked about. I'd also suggest go to a software conference, go to a Kubernetes conference, go to a software automation, a dev, go to, uh, stretch our boundaries. Security is, it's, it's all of it. It's a part of it. So we look forward to that. Please join us again on our next CISO talk. And we look forward to talking with you. Thank you, everybody.